Take your Bibles out this morning, and I, let me tell you, I am encouraged. Let me just tell you how I'm encouraged. I'm encouraged as I walk around and, and talk to many of you before service and see you come in and see you leave, that you're carrying your Bibles with you. I just, now, I know some people get guilted out on this, but I, I, just, I tell you, I'm just, I, I, I just want to say thank you. I think there's something powerful about the written word. I believe in electronic, and I've got all my notes electronically here and all of that. But there's just something about when you can open up the Word of God. Because I always want to preach to you from the Word of God. Let me me say it one more time. See if that's what you want me to do. I said, I I want to preach to you from the Word of God. And there's, there's something that happens when you can connect with the Word of God uh, on, on the written page. I just, I... I, maybe I'm, you say, well, you're just old school. Well, say what I am, but everybody that I know of, that, that, that's the, you can take notes, you can underline things, you can go back and find that, find that verse and everything. I just, I just encourage you to do that. Now, if you're totally electronic in that, God bless you, and you're way ahead of me that. But every experience I've had and everything that I've seen is that there's just something powerful about seeing it written on a page that you can take some notes on. So I, I just want to commend those of you and say thank you for for doing that. First uh, Kings chapter 18. First Kings chapter 18. I want to pick up where I left off last week. Last week I gave you a story out of the New Testament of the glory of God, the power of God, uh, where it talked about the disciples said with great power. Everybody say great power. So we talked about that last week of the, the power of God manifest that was the, the calling card of the New Testament church. And we talked about that. So I don't need to re-preach that message. You can go back and watch it on our YouTube channel. I want to go to the Old Testament now and give you an example of that very same thing and what it took to bring that about. This is the story in 1 Kings chapter 18 of the prophet Elijah and the prophets of Baal. And so let me just look here at one verse that kind of ends the story, and then we will go back and walk you through the story. Verse number 38, 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 38. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust, and it licked up the water that was in the trench. The key words I want to focus on there is then the fire of the Lord fell. Then the fire fell. How many want to see the fire fall today? Amen. The the manifest presence of God, the visible, tangible representation of the power of God. We need the fire of God to fall in our lives today. Can I get an amen? Paul told Timothy, stir up the gift that is within you. And that word stir up there is is to rekindle. It is to, like you would take a fire that was going out and you would stir it up so that it would would fan the flames. The the, the fire would burn. And I'm saying, oh God, one more time, fan the flames. One more time, let the fire of God fall in our lives. And when people around us see what you are doing in and through us, there can be no denying that you are in the midst. Can I get an amen? Amen. Now, the fire is not some type of emotional high, although emotions will be involved in it. It's not some type of of learned program that you go to. The fire is the reality of God coming down among his people. The fire is the thing that shows a lost world that Jesus is the answer. I'll be a little redundant from what I said last week, but people don't need to hear about your religion. They're not, they're not going to be impressed by your religion. They're not going to be impressed by your theology till you can show them the power of your theology. Till they, till you show them that what you, what you believe makes a difference in their lives. I can tell you all about Jesus, but when I give you a testimony of a woman who went to the doctor and the doctor said, there's something here, we need some more tests, and that we prayed and Jesus answered that prayer, went back the next week, and now there's nothing there and he can't explain it, but we can explain it. It is the fire of God. It is the power of God. It's the hand of God. The fire is the thing that when it happens, when it falls, it cannot be denied. It's like the blind man in the Bible. He says, one thing, I I, I can't understand everything about it, but there's one thing I do know, whereas I was blind, now I see. 
And when the fire falls, it breaks the bondage in people's lives. Now, this is a story of the children of Israel when they had wandered away from God. This is the story. you got Jezebel in the story. I don't have time for that. you got Ahab in the story. I don't have time for all that. But they had walked away from God to the point that they had been begun to follow after the worship of Baal. Baal was one of the idols of the Old Testament, one of the gods of the Old Testament, demonic spirits in reality that people began to turn to. And even Israel, and this is so hard to imagine because Israel, of all people, these are the ones that God had brought out of bondage. These are the ones that had been slaves in Egypt for 400 years and God sent Moses and sent signs and wonders through the plagues to the point that Pharaoh said, let, you know, I'll let them go. He brought them out. He brought them across the Red Sea, opened up. They walked across on dry land. He fed them with manna from on high that came. The, I mean, the food fell out of the sky when they were thirsty and they needed water. They spoke to the rock and the rock produced water. I mean, miracle after miracle after miracle, the children of Israel had experienced. Experience. And God had brought them into the promised land. We can just go down the line. But yet, here, the children of Israel once again fall back into worshiping idols. Don't think it can't happen to you, friends. Don't think that just because one time you were on fire for God, one time you were walking with God, one time you had a relationship with God, do not think that you cannot be drawn back into worshiping the gods of this world. And that's exactly where the children of Israel are. They, they had gotten to the point where they had put up idols and they were worshiping these idols. And Elijah comes on the scene. And Elijah says, this is not right. He's a prophet of God. And so the prophets of Baal, the, 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 the preachers of the, of the first church of Baal, he challenged them. He said, here's what we're going to do. If, 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 if Baal is God, then let's serve him. But if Jehovah is God, then we need to serve him. So we need to find out really who is the real God. Of course, he knew. He said, so what we'll do is we'll gather everybody together and let everybody see this. I mean, it was showdown on Mount Carmel. He said, prophets of Baal, you establish an altar, you offer up a sacrifice, and you call upon Baal. And, and, and then I'll set up an altar and present a sacrifice, and I'll call upon Jehovah. And the God that answers by fire, then we'll know. Well, I mean, it was put up or shut up at that time. And so Elijah said, all right, you guys go first. And so they did. They, they set up their altar at the beginning of the day, got everything ready, sacrificed. They're up on the mountain, Mount Carmel, and it it's, it's overlooks a big valley. I've been there. And, and so the children of Israel were there at the base of that mountain so they could look up and they could see everything that was going on. And so that was the challenge that was before them. And so the prophets of Baal, they, they began to, 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 to call upon Baal. They began to sacrifice to Baal. They did this thing all day long, and nothing happened. The fire did not fall. Let me tell you, religion will not get the fire. Religion will just bring confusion into your life. Religion, it sounds good, but it doesn't reach the ear of God. It looks good, but it has no life in it. It said to the Pharisees that said, you know, you look good, but so does a sepulcher. So does a graveyard that looks good, but there's nothing but dead bones in it. And at the end of the day, when they had sacrificed, when they had, they had worshiped, they did everything they could. They even got to the point that they began to afflict themselves. They began to sacrifice themselves. They took knives and began to cut themselves to somehow appease the God Baal. And at the end of the day, cut, bleeding, nothing had done. It just drained the life of them. And friends, when you worship and follow after any other gods but Jehovah, any other God but Jesus, if you make anything else the Lord of your life, it will do nothing but drain the life out of you. It will just slowly suck the life out of you to the point that you'll try everything, you'll do everything to try to satisfy that desire, satisfy that lust within yourself, and all it will do is drain the life out of you till the end of the day, you're going to be far worse than where you started. And we could, we could have people tell, tell the stories today. All of us could sit up here and say that when we were away from God and we were not following God, how the enemy was slowly taking the life out of us and they didn't get the fire of God. The fire did not fall. The sacrifice just sat there. 
Now, at the end of the story that I read for you a few moments ago, we know that the fire fell. So for Elijah, so how did Elijah get the fire to fall? That's what I want to talk to you about for the next three hours. <laughs> now, we're going to go quick today. I, I, just, I just want to give you very quickly the simplicity of really how you can get the fire to fall in your life. So we need to follow the example of Elijah. So go back to your, your Bible there and look at verse number 30. It says, Then Elijah said to all the people, Come near to me. So all the people came near to him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. The first thing that if you're going to see the fire of God fall in your life, you've got to come near to God. You've got to come near to God. You're not going to find the fire of God afar off from God. You're going to find the fire, the presence, the power of God as you come close to God. But now, here's something I'll be honest. I didn't, I, I'd been looking at this verse, and this week as I looked at it again, I said, man, I read that wrong. It doesn't say come near to God. Elijah said, come near to me. Elijah said, come, come near to me. Here's, here's what it's going to take. For the fire of God, it's going to take a group of people that are willing to be the example of people that will walk close to God. It's going to take individuals that are going to lead other people into the presence and the power of God. I don't know about you. I want to be that person. I want to be that person that people can look at me or, as Paul said, follow me as I follow Jesus. Nobody's willing to be an example today. Everybody's looking for examples, but nobody's willing to be an example. If we're going to see the fire of God fall among the people of God, it's going to take individuals that are going to say, I am committing myself to being a follower of Jesus Christ. I'm going to get close to God so that other people that are close to me will get close to God also. Oh, come on. Somebody say amen. Matter of fact, turn this up in this monitor a little bit. This is good preaching. I may need to hear some of this. He said, come near to me. Elijah was the model. Why don't you be that person? Why don't, why don't you be that person? Why don't you dedicate within your life to say, you know what? I'm going to be somebody that people can follow to get closer to God. There's some people that draw people away from God. Don't look at anybody. I want to be somebody that draws people closer to God. I want to be people that, that when they look at me, they can say, yeah, look, he's been in the presence of God. That's what they said about the disciples who read it for you. These people have been in the presence of Jesus. There's something different about their life. Oh, if you'll just give me 120 people that will come and be close to God and get in the presence of God, I will change a city. But it first takes that hunger. They that hunger and thirst after righteousness will be filled. It takes those individuals that say, I'm going to be that one. Everybody wants to look to everybody else. But why don't we start looking to ourselves and say, I need to, I need to come near to God. And when you'll come near to God, you'll be in that position that you can see the fire fall. Turn to somebody and say, get close to God. Just tell them, get close to God. So the first thing you got to do is you got to come near to God. And you get that by people that are willing to lead you into the presence of God. I thank God for people in my life that led me into the presence of God. My pastor called me the other day, and, or I called him. I can't remember. We, we called back and forth. The pastor that so was engaged in, in my life and the one that gave me the word to come here to Fresno and that was in my upbringing. And he's 90, 96, 94. Huh? 94, he's 94. And so we talk on occasion once a month or so. I try to get in touch with him, and I just thanked him. And I said, thank you so much, Pastor, for, for being someone that I could learn about being in the presence of God. Do your kids see you go into the presence of God? Do your family see you go into the presence of God? Do you lead them that way? Come near to me because we're going to get close to God. So the second thing, first of all, you come near to God. The second thing, he repaired the altar. He repaired the altar. Verse number uh, 31, it says, And Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Israel shall be your name. So there was an order to this thing. Coming into the presence of God for the fire of God to manifest within your life is not done haphazardly. 
It is not done just by happenstance. It's not just, it's, just, it's not a coincidence. It's something that is planned and strived for in your life. Those that seek the Lord, those that knock, those that, that search, the, it's, it's purposeful in what you're doing. And so look at the order and what Elijah did to bring this thing in. He took 12 stones based on the 12 tribes of Israel. In other words, what he was doing, he was building on the commitment of the past. You've got these 12 tribes now, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, of the covenant that had been given to them, and he begins to place those things. I think many times the fire of God does not fall on people's life because they don't have any order in their life. They're not building upon the past of what God has done in their life. They're just waking up every day into a new world. Oh, here I am. But when you want to see the fire of God fall in your life that is going to make a difference in your life and the difference of other people's, it is going to be something that is, that is going to be done in order. There's going to be a discipline to it. There's going to be a strategy to it. There's going to be a pattern to it. And so what Elijah did is he took those 12. He could have just piled up stones. He says, no, these are, I'm going to take 12 stones because there's 12 tribes of the sons of Jacob, the sons of Israel, these 12 tribes. Matter of fact, I think another reason that he did that is because each one of those tribes were represented right down there in that valley watching him. And, and you see then what you build upon, that you build upon the commitment of the past. And, and then notice that he said, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Israel shall be my name. What he's referring to there is the covenant that God had made with Abraham, with Isaac, with Jacob, with these 12 tribes. What we build upon is not, our, is not merely our, our feelings, or our emotions. It, what we are building upon is the promise of God's word. I see i got to slow down. Okay, let me slow it down now. If we're not careful, we get involved so many times with what we experience. And, and you're going to experience the power of God. It's going to be an experience. I, I want when you come to church, I want it to be an experience. I want it to be, warning, I'm going to date myself now. I want it to be an e-ticket ride. How many have any idea of what I just said? How many have no idea what that means, an e-ticket ride? You youngsters. How many don't even know if you're here this morning? I saw. <laughs> Disneyland, when you go, you used to get a book, of, a book of tickets. And there were different classes of rides. And the little rides, you got you know, a bunch of A tickets. You got a bunch of A tickets, but you only got two E tickets. Because that was the big rides. If you wanted to ride the rides, you could ride them, but you had to buy more e-tickets. So the e-ticket was the big ride. That was the roller coaster. That was the good stuff. I want every time you come to church to be an e-ticket ride. I want it to be something that you walk away and say, man, that was an experience this morning. We were in the presence of God. We heard testimonies of victory and of power. Lives were touched and changed. I want you to experience it. But it's not going to happen because of experience. Experience don't just happen until first there is a covenant made with God and that there is a strategy and that there is a commitment that you make to that. If you want to go deeper in the power of God, deeper in the manifestation of God within your life, if you want to see that, then you need to put the altar back together. Now, here's, here is another key word that was used about this. It says that Elijah repaired the altar. That means the altar was broken down. That was broken down because of what the prophets of Baal have done. Has the devil messed up your altar? Has, has the things of this world messed up your altar? Do you need to repair your altar? I'm not talking about what it once was. I'm talking about what is it right now. What is your altar right now? And if we're not careful, we'll let the things of the past, we'll let the circumstance, we'll let the problem, we'll let people tear down our altars, our commitments to God. 
Well, I can't go to church. This we're going to go do this. Well, I'm not going to read my Bible because I've got a commitment. I mean, those things that we've committed to God, that we've let other things, other circumstances, other people, the, 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 the what the enemy brings us to pull us away from our commitment to the altar of God. Boy, you got quiet on me on that one. Because see, everybody wants the fire to fall, but nobody wants to repair an altar. Everybody wants to experience the power of God, but they don't want to experience the sacrifice. Paul said that I might know him in the fellowship of his suffering and in the power of his resurrection. You're not going to get a resurrection until you get a crucifixion. And it's going to take people who are willing to say, I am committing myself to getting close to God, to following God. I'm going to get the idols of this world out of my life, and I'm going to be somebody that people can follow to get into the presence of God. Don't you know you are a holy priesthood? You're the ones that God has selected to come into his presence. You're the one that God has selected to lead a nation, to lead a people, to be the example of his power and his glory. That's going to take repairing the altar. Getting back to times of prayer, getting back to times of commitment, getting back to times that you're saying, God, I'm giving it all. So you've got to, you've got to come close to God. You've got to repair the altar. I just, I just want to stop for just a moment because I want you to stop and think about your altar. Your altar of prayer. Your, your altar of, 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 of commitment to the Lord. Your altar of the covenant of his word. And you say, well, it's been a long time. Well, then you need to repair it. Amen. You can repair it. You can put it back together. You can renew that commitment that you had with the Lord. You can stack those stones back up. Nothing can keep you from doing that. I don't care how much you danced with the devil. Then get that behind you and build your altar, repair your altar, get back to the commitment of God. Because I've seen some of the greatest altars of commitment from people whose altars were destroyed by the devil. That those people said, I ain't going to do that no more. I see where that led me. And now I know the importance of having that altar and that commitment in my life. So, so we, we've got to come near to God. We've got to repair the altar. And then the third thing is we've got to offer the sacrifice. We've got to offer the sacrifice. It says in verse 33, and he put the wood on the, in order, cut the bull in pieces, and laid it on the wood, and said, fill four water pots with water and pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. So he, so he put the wood in order. If you want a fire to burn, you've got to put the wood in order. Any woodsman out there, anybody who's gone camping, know that you don't just throw a bunch of wood out there and try to light. No, if you really want to build a fire right, there's a way that you stack that wood where you put the kindling, where you put the small twigs, where you put the, 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 the larger wood, where you leave it open where it can breathe, and that where you light it, it will burn properly. There is a system and an order to it. That's why there needs to be discipline in our lives. There's an order in our life. He sacrificed the bull. He cut it into pieces. He laid it on the wood. These, these again, he, these were things of value, things that everybody looked at. Boy, those are, those are nice bulls and everything. And so he, he cut it into pieces. He killed it. He sacrificed it. He laid it on the wood. In other words, he released it. What is it that you're hanging on to that God is wanting you to release? What is it that you're hanging on to that God says, nope, that needs to go on the altar? Because many times we'll put things on the altar, but then we'll pick them back up as soon as the fire begins to get hot. Yeah, you didn't know I was going to go this way today, did you? What, what, what is it that God's calling you? You need to sacrifice that. Now, now we, we look at sacrifice in such a negative way. Oh, I'm sacrifice. i got to sacrifice. I'm going to sacrifice. This is such a sacrifice. Well, at least I came to church today. I sacrificed and came to church. I got up early. I sacrificed. Well, I listen to you. 
you need to understand what sacrifice is. Sacrifice is the avenue to the power in the presence of God. God has given us the opportunity because let me just tell you, in this new covenant that we have, it is not our sacrifice, it was his sacrifice. He was the Lamb of God. Jesus laid down his life for us, and all we've got to do is walk in that sacrifice. So the sacrifice that was made for us on Calvary, if we will walk in that, but I... You know, Jesus rose from the dead, and some of you can't even get out of bed. <laughs> preach on, preach on, preacher, preach on, preacher. Now I'm going to duck and let it hit the person behind you. Sacrifice is not a bad thing. Sacrifice is not a negative thing. Sacrifice, again, is that avenue that we have before the Lord. He said, come and, 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 and offer the sacrifice. He laid the wood on it. And, and then, not only did he do that, but then he said, now go get me some, some jugs of water, and we're going to pour water on this stuff. He, he was doing that. He said, dig a trench around this thing, and we're going we're gonna to we're, we're fill water all around this thing. Not just a little bit on top. I want water standing around it. We're going to soak this wood. I don't want there to be any doubt whatsoever that this was God that did this. I don't know how to say this, but I'm just going to say it. Some of y'all are, are really all wet. Outside of a move of God, there's no way you would be in church today. Outside of a, of a move of God, outside of the manifestation of God in your life, you wouldn't be in church. You'd be at a bar, you'd be hung over, you'd be in a hospital, you'd be, you'd come on, you'd be in a jailhouse, you'd, come on, somebody help, you know that. So for you to be here today is an example of the power and the presence of God to work in somebody's life. We've got to come near to God. We've got to repair the altar, and we've got to offer the sacrifice. And I'll just say it one more time. What is it that God is telling you you need to sacrifice? What is it that God is telling you that you need to do? So what were the results that I'm about through? The results were simply this. In verse 36, and it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and that I have done all these things at your word. He then said, hear me, O Lord, hear me that this people may know that you are the Lord God and that you have turned their hearts back to you again. Elijah had the right motive. His whole motive in doing this was not that he would become the superstar. He said, these people need to know who you are. They've lost track of who you are. They're serving Baal. They're worshiping. I'm not trying to show up these prophets of Baal. I'm trying to show these people down here in this valley that you are God. And so, Lord, show up today so that there will be no doubt whatsoever that you are God. Let me tell you, Fresno needs to see a group of people that can demonstrate the fire of God in their life, that there can be no doubt whatsoever that has got to be God. For that bunch of folks to do what they have done to see God move in their life, that has to be the hand of God. That has to be God when the fire falls. So how did God respond? Verse 38, then the fire of the Lord fell, consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust, and it licked up the water that was in the trench. Can, can you just get what I'm saying here today? That if you'll get close to God, if you'll repair the altar in your life, if you're willing to offer the sacrifice, God says, I'll send you the fire. I'll send you the fire, not so that you can enjoy the fire, but that the people around you will know without a doubt 
that I'm the one that did it because I'm going to lick up the stones. I'm going to lick up the dust. I'm going to lick up the water. That's a total transformation. How many are total transformations in this place today? That once you were in darkness and now you are in light. Once you were in bondage and now you are free. Once you were in the kingdom of the enemy and now you are in the kingdom of God. God has lapped up everything that the enemy has tried to do in your life. Old things have passed away and all things have become new. That's what God wants to do in your life. How did the people respond? When all the people, verse 39, when all the people saw this, when all the people felt this, no, when all the people saw this, there needs to be things that happen in your life that are visible to those that are around you. People need to see the change in your life. They don't need to hear you talk about it. Oh, I'm a Christian. Well... I know you got the bumper sticker, but you just cussed me out last night. You came in drunk the night before. You hadn't been to church in a month and a half. You don't even know where your Bible's at. Shall I continue? When the people saw, when they saw what God had done, let the people see what God has done. Testify of what God, it says, when they saw this, they fell prostrate and cried. The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. I want the fire to fall at Cornerstone. I want the fire to fall at Cornerstone. But it's not going to happen because of a special speaker. It's not going to happen because of a worship team that we bring in. It's not going to happen because we just plan a meeting. It's going to happen because we're going to get close to God. It's going to happen because we're going to repair the altars in our life. It's going to happen because we're willing to sacrifice and when we do that, and we then say, now, Lord, use us an exam- as an example to show this city what will happen when the fire falls. And they will declare, the Lord, he is 